What's up, guys? Welcome back to another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot podcast, where this week we're still in the book of Psalms, which is a great devotional book for us to read, to reconnect in our relationship with the Lord. And we're also in the book of Romans. And this week, it seems as if the book of Romans is going to present us with some of the toughest, most challenging, yet most rewarding sections that the book of Romans has. So we're going to spend more time on that than in the Psalms. But just a quick word on the Psalms. We're still in book three. And remember, book three starts with Asaph. He writes Psalm 33 to 83. Then we got the sons of Korah in 84, 85, then David in 86, and then sons of Korah again in 87 and 88. And it ends with Ethan the Ezraite writing Psalm 89. So what are the sections about that we're reading this week? We've got Psalm 78. That's the first one we're going to read, which we'll take a whole day doing that. And it's all about telling the coming generation of the history of God. So verse four of that text says, we will not hide them from their children, but tell the coming generation, the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. The problem with the Israelites before, as it says in verse 11, is they forgot his works. Now, that's having to do with history, but that's really like an analysis of of your own history. That's Israel looking back saying, you know, the problem with us is that we forgot what God did. That is a constant refrain that we see in the book of Psalms and elsewhere in the scriptures. God's people need to remember what God has done. If God's people remember what God has done, They will oftentimes live rightly in relationship to God, fearing the Lord as they should do. Uh, It recalls things that the Israelites did. Verse 17 says, Yet they, the Israelites, sinned against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. So we see these Israelites, they're not keeping God's rules. They're not fearing him the way they should. Where did that all start? They forgot the works of God. Then later in verse 38, it says about God, Yet he, being compassionate, atoned for their iniquity and did not destroy them. And by the end of the chapter, we see the description of God installing David as king over his nation. So a lot of grace, a lot of forgiveness, but a lot of sin for these Israelites. And what's the point? The point of remembering this history and not just remembering it for oneself, but telling the coming generation. Why do we do that? Because we're trying to connect people with God to think we need to fear the Lord. As a group, these Israelites are thinking we need to fear God. What's the best way to do that? Well, it's to remember what God has done and to tell the coming generation. So uh, Psalm 80 is another one to highlight. It talks about the future of the northern tribes of Israel. It it describes some king figure that's going to reunite all 12 tribes, probably a reference back to this Messiah that we've been talking about from Psalm 2 and Psalm 16 and from Psalm 110 that we'll get to later. Um, That's important. We also have Psalm 84, another one to highlight. It has some very, very poetic language uh, that should be devotional. Again, should remind you, like, this is the way that godly people think about God. Psalm 8410 says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Like, that's what a righteous heart wants to do. It wants to be with God's people in God's house, participating even in God's worship, even if it's in a small way, like being a doorkeeper, that's not a huge role for the Levites or something like that, but it's significant. And it's the heart of a person who loves God. The sons of Korah write that. Then Psalm 85, another famous one, which talks about from the heart of people who are representing this nation, they ask God, they plead with God, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant to us your salvation. Again, a verse that has been used by Christians to to call on God to save people and to revive us. I think it's appropriate for God's people to ask God this question. God, will you not revive us again? We want to be people who are living in right relation with God, and we want others in our community to do the same. So it's calling on God to keep his promise. And for us, we don't look back to the Abrahamic promise of um the Israelites in the land. We don't look back to the Davidic promise necessarily of David being king. When we think about these promises, we're thinking primarily about the promise of the gospel that Jesus promises to save sinners who look to him, who confess and repent of their sins, and who trust in Jesus and put their full faith in him. We ask God the same thing. Revive us again. Let people see that. Then in Psalm 86, the one song from David that's in the midst of all these songs, it says in verse 11, very famous, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. 
And this is a great verse that teaches us something about our heart and something about devotion to God, that we need to have a unified heart. We need to focus on one thing. So oftentimes we have divided hearts. And even James talks about the double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways, or the, the person who entertains idols, as we see at the end of 1 John. We're not even supposed to entertain idols. We're not supposed to, as James 4, 4 says, be friends with the world, because in so doing, we make ourselves an enemy of God. And David here says, God, unite my heart. I want to focus on you. It's even reflecting the truth we see from David earlier in Psalm 27, 4. That one thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in your house, that I may pursue the Lord. Like That's what David wanted. David wanted God, and he wanted God to be the highest aim in his life, to seek and know God. So uh, that's Psalm 86. Then Psalm 88, another important one. It's a unique lament psalm because it doesn't end with trust in your steadfast love. It doesn't end with some good thing. Some people call it the darkest psalm because there's nothing positive. It's all sad. It doesn't really get positive in that song. Uh, so that's just another one to take note of. Again, not every song has to, to end in a nice way. Some of the, the the most impactful psalms are the most emotional, and they don't end well, and this one doesn't end well. But Psalm 89, the next one, it's the end of book number three, where um, Ethan the Ezraite writes really about the Davidic covenant. So in Psalm 89, you're going to see quotes of Second Samuel 7. You're going to think about the Davidic covenant again. Some interesting highlights here. Psalm 89, verse 35 says, Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne, as long as the sun before me, like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the sky. So clearly, it's from God's perspective writing about David. But what should this do in the hearts of the people after the time of David? It should remind them God has promises for us. God will keep his promises. Then again, verse 49, towards the end of book number three here. It says, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? Which by your faithfulness you swore to David. Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked, how I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations, which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. So again, it's like we're on David's side. We're on the kings of Judah's side. God, it doesn't feel like you're on our side. That's the interesting historical perspective I think we got to have in book number three, really, which leads right to book number four of the Psalms, which goes all the way back to Moses' day, but I think probably constructed around the same time. By constructed, I mean not written, but like when were these songs assembled in this order? I think they were assembled probably in the time of exile or getting close to the time of exile, especially because of some of the late dates that we think some of these psalms are written by. Like some of them will talk about being in Babylon and being in the exile. But here, the author and the compiler, however, the Psalms were finally put together in the form that we have them now. They take us back to Moses and they take us back really to the time of the, the Israelites in the wilderness to remind us, like, we have to be people of the book. We got to go back to what Moses said. So there's a, a lot of emphasis on Moses. There's emphasis on his writing. There's an emphasis on, you know, what the book of Deuteronomy says about keeping the law. We see that here in book number four. So starts with Psalm 90, probably the most famous in the whole section. It's the only one written by Moses. And it starts off by saying to God, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So taking us all the way back to the beginning, right? God has been a dwelling place for his people. Whether we're talking about Eden or whether we're talking about the wilderness or whether we're talking about the land of Goshen and Egypt, or we're talking about Jerusalem, or we're talking about exile, or we're talking about, you know, you could even be Esther in the city of Susa, right? God has been a dwelling place for his people, even if they haven't had a place to live. And at this point in Moses' history, most of the stuff I just talked about hadn't even happened yet. But God has been a dwelling place for his people. Verse 3 says, You return man to dust, and you say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Moses says with God, he sends people back to the dust. That's a reference back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, the curse that when we sin, we have to die, and God sends us back to the dust because we were made out of the dust. So it's a reference back to there. And 
probably what's happening at this time in Moses' life is all the Israelites are dying in the wilderness. He's looking around and, and he's like, God, you're sending people back to the ground. I keep having to bury all these people. Verse 8 says, you've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And remember, what was the big secret sin of the Israelites? The big secret sin was grumbling. It was the fact they were complaining against God and distrusting the Lord and distrusting Moses, the leader in the process. Verse 10 says, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble and they're soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? Like who even gets it? So verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. So Moses reflects and he says, look, everybody's dying. People are dying at 70 or 80. And today we look and we say pretty much the same thing. And we keep living and we keep dying and we keep having years go by where our friends keep dying and our loved ones and our acquaintances keep going back to the dust. What do we do? Well, we number our days, right? Not that you can number them in the sense that you can look at how many you have in the future. You don't know that, but you take stock of your life and you want wisdom. You want to fear God. You want to recognize that God is your home. You want to obey God in the midst of it. That's what Psalm 90 teaches us. Then Psalm 91 talks about how God is a refuge, another famous Psalm. Psalm 93 speaks about how God reigns over the whole earth, that it's not as if we believe that God is a local deity, like many of the ancient deities, that, oh, God is in charge of this realm or that realm. That's not how our God is. Our God makes the heavens and the earth. Our God reigns over all of it. And there's no realm or there's no place in which God is not firmly in charge. So another encouraging Psalm that you'll read there. So we move from book three to book four. We end there in Psalm 95. That's the last Psalm we'll read this week. Uh, But we're still right here in the heart of the book of Psalms. I hope it's an encouragement to you to read. Uh, But now I want to shift our focus to the New Testament, where again, like I said at the beginning, Romans 7 through 11 is very tough for people. Some There are some interpretive challenges here to understand what exactly did Paul mean. But I think it's it's more than that. These are some of the richest chapters because if you understand what Paul is getting at, he's talked about how bad our sin is. He's talked about our need for salvation. He's talked about how salvation is accomplished through Jesus and how it's applied to our lives through faith. And he's talked about sanctification, about how you know, we're supposed to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Now we get to some of the richest parts of the scriptures here where, in fact, Romans chapter 8 is probably one of the most encouraging sections in the entire Bible. But it starts here in our reading with Romans chapter 7, which is a tough one to interpret. The reason is because Paul is dealing with his fleshly struggle against the law and against um, his own sinfulness. So really, it's like sin versus the, the law. And he says, When you have the law, it brings about sin. Like if I know there's a rule that I'm not supposed to break, sometimes just knowing that rule itself brings about the breaking of that rule. And he says, that's kind of how it works. But he says, is the law bad though? No, the law is not bad. The, The law of God, are we talking about the Torah? Are we talking about Deuteronomy? Are we talking about God's righteous standard for us? Well, that's not bad. And he says, you should never think that the law is bad. But sin in you, is bad in your flesh it's it's bad it's wrong um, so sometimes christians get confused like okay is the law good or bad and, and sometimes we talk as if laws and rules from god are bad and not for our good and he says no no, no. the law is good it was the commandment that was promised to produce life has proved to be death to me sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me so the law is holy And the commandment is holy and righteous and good. And then he asks in verse 13, did that which is good then bring death to me? Is it the law that made death of me? No, by no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, the law, in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. It's like even that law shows how sinful our sinfulness is and it makes it even worse in the light of God's holy standard. So that leads to this interpretive problem. And here's the big question everyone has about Romans 7. Who is Paul writing about? Is he talking about a person who's a Christian who's struggling against sin? Because it sure looks like it. Or is he talking about a person before they become a Christian? Really, he's talking about himself. So that's key number one. He's talking about himself. 
But when is he talking about himself? Is he talking about himself right now? And here's the question. Would a person who writes later in chapter 8, in verse number 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but are in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Okay. The guy who writes that, would he say about himself in verse 14 of chapter 7, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. That's the challenge. And inversely, would a person write about their former self? Like Paul, if, if Paul's really writing about his former self, would he say stuff like this in verse 22 of chapter 7? For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Right? Would a person write that about their life before Christ? That's one of the arguments to say, hey, this is probably talking about a Christian. So people go back and forth on this. You know, I don't want to sound too confusing, but I'd say right now, based on, I think, the reading of Romans 8, 1 through 11, clearly speaking about the difference between having the spirit and being in the flesh. Being in the flesh seems to be code not just for being in the body, although that's true. It seems to be code for you're not in the spirit. You can't be in the spirit and the flesh at the same time. It doesn't seem to be what we're talking about here. Um, so I think that Paul is describing his life before Christ, but it doesn't mean that this doesn't feel like our experience in Christ. I think in Christ, we still struggle against sin. In fact, many people really only struggle against sin once they're in Christ. They say they struggle against sin before, but they really don't struggle against sin. They just do sinful things. They're just enslaved to sinful things. But there seems to be too much uh, incongruity or, or there's too much difference between what chapter 6 and 8 speak about how you don't have to sin. You don't have to present your body as slaves to sin. In fact, you're free. I mean, here in Romans 8, 1 and 2, I'll read it. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So he seems to be describing a before and an after. A, a place of loss and a place of victory. Which again, I totally recognize it. Even in the Christian life, you can experience both of those things. But I think he's trying to draw a distinction between the old life and the new life. So here we get to chapter 8, which, like I said, is probably one of the most encouraging passages. And one of the problems, though, is people start in Romans 8. They want to tell people, hey, God is for you. God is for you. But if you've been reading the book of Romans, you know that God is not just for everybody doing whatever they want to do. In fact, that's been the whole book of Romans, that God's righteousness is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. So no, God is not for everybody in their sin. But look who he is for. These people that have understood the bad news of their sin. Romans 1 to 3. The people who've understood the good news that Jesus is the only solution to be received by faith. We don't work our way to salvation. No, we receive salvation through the work of Jesus, through trusting in him. Now we get to Romans 8. Now we get to people being led by the Spirit, adopted by God, crying, Abba, Father. We get to Romans 8.18, which says something amazing. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. You can't take that verse without understanding the gospel. You can't take that verse without understanding your sin. Because the sufferings of this present time are nothing compared to the, the, the torments of being separated from God. So everybody wants to read themselves into this, but this is only about you if you have the Spirit. This is only about you if you've trusted in Jesus. This is only about you if you've recognized, I'm a sinner, I'm, I'm in need of salvation, and Jesus is the only one who can do that. That's who this verse is for. I mean, it goes on another very famous section here in the middle, Romans 8, 28. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So even that, everyone reads that and says, oh yeah, God's got a good plan for me. It's like, who does God have a good plan for? Well, here he's talking about those who love God. And what's the good? What's the good plan? Well, that God's working everything out according to his purpose. The next verse talks about his purpose. His purpose for the Christian is that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might become the firstborn among many brothers. So what's the good thing that God has planned for you? 
in any situation, in every situation. God has a plan that you would be conformed to the image of Christ, that you'd be like Jesus more and more. Verse 30 says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified, which leads Paul right in the next verse. He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? That is probably one of the greatest promises in the whole Bible. If God is for us, who can be against us? In what sense? Well, it says in verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? The answer is he will, right? If he's done all this to save us, if he's killed his son as a sacrifice to save his people, and if we're rightly aligned with him because we trust in Jesus as the only sacrifice for sin, if that's true, right? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to tell God, God, you can't save that person. That person's too bad. That person's too sinful. He says, who should bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justified. You want to go complain to God about why a Christian shouldn't be forgiven? God's like, well, I'm the one who forgave them. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus died. More than that, he was raised. And right now he's at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us. Right? So if someone wants to bring a charge against God's people and say, you know, they're really bad, they, they shouldn't be one of God's people. Paul says, well, remember, God elected. Jesus lives to intercede for us. He died on the cross for us. And then Paul brings it back to their real life. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're super conquerors because of what Jesus did for us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing better than that. To realize that God's word says, if you're in, you're in. If you're in with Christ, if you trust him, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. But you can't start in Romans 8. You got to start in Romans chapter 1. These promises are precious, but who are they precious for? They're precious for the people that are rightly aligned with God through trusting in Jesus. Now, it leads into Romans 9, 10, and 11, which we're going to be reading this week. Again, more complicated sections of scripture that people don't seem to like. Right? These things hold together, right? Like, if you like Romans 8, you're going to understand Romans 9, and if you understand Romans 9, you're probably going to get 10 and 11, but our minds kind of fight against this. We don't like what it has to say. But basically, you could summarize it by, by this. Right? If really, if nothing can thwart God's plan for us, for his people, if nothing can separate us from the love of God, Paul says, don't you think it's the same with God's permanent promises that he's made to his covenant people, Israel? Like the Jewish people? Like, don't you think that if God is going to continue with us and nothing can separate us from, from Christ's love? And don't you think that God's promises to his people, those are going to stand too, aren't they? Right? Oh, see, those things kind of go together. Verse six says uh, of chapter nine, it's not as if the word of God has failed, but then he, he brings up this point. He says, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So is every Israelite an elect child of God? Well, clearly not. Clearly many are not saved. We saw that all throughout the old Testament. We clearly see that in the time of Jesus, some embrace him, some reject him, but this group, this group is, is supposed to be saved in the sense that they're a chosen group of people, but he's going to make this interesting promise. In this group, there is only a remnant that will be saved. We see that all the way down in verse 27. We see that a remnant will be saved. That's a, a small group within the bigger group. So that was true of the Israelites in Jesus' day. That's true even now, right? Some of God's chosen people, Israelites, are saved today, but only the ones who trust in Jesus as their Savior. And now some people say, is this fair? He quotes the Old Testament. He says, as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, right? One brother was chosen, the other was not, right? Verse 14, this is where it gets tricky. This is the, the section that people don't like, but... Again, I think you should read honestly, just as we try to read all the Bible honestly. And I think you're going to come away with the conclusion that Paul was telling the truth here. Uh, it's not an exaggeration. 
Verse 14 says, What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he who says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy, which is a promise that we see all throughout. I, I, that initially, John chapter 1, verses 11, 12, 13, talks about how the Israelites did not receive Jesus, but to some, God had caused them to be born again, not by the will of man or of blood, but of the will of God, right? Salvation is a God thing. It's up to God. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I've raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. That part is the hard part for us. It's like we think, okay, it makes sense that God would have mercy only on those who repent and only on those who change. And that's true. And the text doesn't contradict that. But the part that we have a little harder time with is he hardens whomever he wills. And what do we mean by that? Like, that's a callback to Pharaoh. Pharaoh hardened his heart. But the text also says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What's the right answer? Who hardened whose heart, right? Well, Pharaoh certainly hardened his heart by choosing to do what's sinful. But Paul like takes a bigger step back and says, but remember, it's God ultimately that hardened Pharaoh's heart in the grand scheme of things. He goes on, next verse, verse 19. You will say then to me, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? In other words, like, how can God judge someone for sin if like nobody can resist God's will of salvation? Paul's answer is, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Even us, whom he's called, not only from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. What's the point? But Paul is saying, look, God can do what he wants in salvation. He can do what he wants in judgment because he's right and he's just. And the truth that we saw earlier in Romans chapter two is that people sin against God and his law and their conscience, even if they don't have an express law right in front of them. So I don't think God is unfair to judge these people. I don't think God is unfair to choose some for salvation and others to pass over for judgment. Right? They are allowed to sin. And God, that is how God hardens our hearts, right? We saw that in Romans chapter one. He gives them up. He gives them over. Is it like God is saying, oh, you got to sin. You got to sin. That's not how it works. Not in human experience. People choose to sin. People choose to do what's wrong. But God certainly is a part of that in the sense that it's not like, God is the victim of some crime that he doesn't know about, right? This is clearly something that's a part of his big plan. So yes, God is still sovereign over people's unbelief. That is still true. And I think if you read this text, honestly, you can't come away with any other thought than that, even if it doesn't kind of vibe with what you think. And then Paul understands that, like he's going to go on. He's going to talk about like, look, my desire and prayer to God is that they would be saved. He says that about these people. I mean, even right before that, at the end of chapter 9, he says, why did the Israelites fail? It's because they did not pursue it by faith. That is as if it were based on some works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. He quotes Isaiah 28 there. Uh, point is, like, the Jewish people as a whole did not embrace Jesus. But one day, will they? Yes. How are they going to do that? Well, through the gospel. And, and that's what chapter 10 is all about. He says, look, Jews, Gentiles, how are we saved? He has an amazing section in, in verse number nine. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And then he talks about how we, we believe and we, we trust and we confess who Jesus is. And he quotes the Old Testament. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? So this is how God's salvation plan is working out in the world, through God sending people to preach the good news to others. He says, so he quotes the Old Testament. 
How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they've not all obeyed the gospel, for even Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what they've heard from us? So, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. That verse, super, super important for us when we think about evangelism. Faith comes from hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. That is God's plan. That is how he's doing it. So, do you say, oh man, well, because, you know, God's going to save whoever he wants and harden whoever he wants, you know, I don't need to do anything to share this message. Paul's like, no, no, that's God's plan. God's ordained means of salvation is that people would preach, people would hear, and people would respond in faith through hearing the word of Christ. So Romans 9 does not take any responsibility away from anyone. It doesn't take your responsibility away as a Christian from sharing the truth, and it doesn't take people's responsibility away. It doesn't take away responsibility from people who say, well, I'm just not a Christian. I can do whatever I want. You know, it's, it's not my fault. I would have been a sinner anyway. It doesn't take away their responsibility either. So back to the Israelite question. Paul gets back to that here in chapter 11, verse number five. He says, so too, at the present time, there is a remnant. So he's like, it's like the time of Elijah. There's a remnant now chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So God has a remnant of Jewish people. Well, what is this like? What happened? Why did God allow this to happen? Verse 11, he says, so then I asked, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Like, did this group of Israelites reject Jesus so that all Israel will all fall away forever and never be saved? He says, by no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Think about it. Like, humanly speaking, if the Israelites, during the time of Jesus, they, if they all just embraced Jesus, well, I suppose the kingdom would have begun, and guess what? You would be lost, I'd be lost, we wouldn't be saved. Right? But God, in this great plan of salvation, thinking even of us, people who are Gentiles, most of us, living on the other side of the world, 2,000 years later, we can be saved? Well, yeah. So verse 12 says, Now, if their trespass means riches for the world and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So he's saying, but Israel's going to embrace Jesus at some point. And what I think that means is ethnic Jews, people who are really descendant from Abraham, they're going to turn and they're going to be saved. So verse 17, he says, but if some of the branches, he gives this analogy of branches and being grafted in, he says, if some of the branches were broken off, And you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you that supports the root. It's the root that supports you, which again uh, is very clear. Christians should not be antagonistic towards Jewish people. They shouldn't be. Even if Jewish people are antagonistic towards us, like Paul's experience was, We should know the truth about the Jewish people and we should preach to the Jewish people. We should call the Jewish people to trust in their Messiah because when the Jewish people trust in their Messiah, guess what? That means the inclusion, uh, when they're included, that means the salvation of the world. That means when the kingdom's going to come. So it's just very important that we see, okay, that's how God is working here. He's, He's grafting these people in, Gentiles, to the natural olive branch and there are some branches that are broke off broken off people who don't embrace jesus but in the end like this is how god's going to save the world it's when the messiah reigns over israel verse 22 says note then the kindness and severity of god severity towards those who have fallen but god's kindness to you provided you continue in his kindness otherwise you too will be cut off if you're an arrogant gentile who doesn't trust in jesus and doesn't proclaim him as lord and you're arrogant towards those Jewish people. He says, look, God can cut you off just as easy. I mean, he cut those Jewish people off pretty quick. Well, not pretty quick. It took them thousands of years, a lot of generations. But then in verse 25, he says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. So when is the kingdom going to come? When is it all going to happen? When are the Jews going to embrace Jesus? Well, I think it's when Jesus comes back. We see that promise in Zechariah 12 that the people of Israel will behold the the one who was pierced, the one that they pierced, and they'll weep for him. And then it says in chapter 14, a fountain of mercy will come out for these Israelites. These people are going to be saved. It's uh, an amazing truth. And all that big cosmic promises leads Paul to end by saying, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. 
How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That is how we respond to understanding this big promise of God. Are you let on a little secret? Yeah, it's kind of like you're getting let in on a secret. But this secret plan that's now re revealed to everybody now is meant to lead us to praise God and to be thankful that we're included in his salvation plan. So that's a pretty meaty section of scripture. I hope that that conversation is helpful for you as you study this week. And I hope that you dig in and you learn a lot from God's word this week. So we'll see you back next time for another Daily Bible Reading Snapshot podcast. Thank you.